Coming up on DTNS, a study on the effects of social media on children, Walmart's cloud gaming service leaks in the epic Apple court battle, and AI that can make dubbed movies better. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May the 4th be with you, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the Podfeed Podcast, this is Allison Sheridan. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about that CEO who got dismissed for taking acid uh, and lots of other stuff on Good Day Internet. Uh, we even uh, have some select quotes from the epic Apple uh, battle. If you want that wider conversation, become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple hired former Google AI researcher Sammy Bengio, who was an early leader with the Google Brain research team. Reuters sources say Bengio will head a new AI research unit under senior VP John John Andrea, who was previously Google's head of machine learning until joining Apple in 2018. Tuesday, India's telecom ministry granted permission to several telecom service providers to begin a six-month trial of 5G in the millimeter wave, mid-band, and sub-gigahertz bands. It also encourages testing of something called 5GI, which is an Indian variant of 5G meant for the specific conditions of the Indian market, particularly rural areas. The approved telecoms include Geo Platforms, Airtel, Vodafone Idea, and MTNL. They will all work with equipment providers Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, and CDOT. No Chinese companies are among the approved participants. Instagram is adding a caption sticker option to stories videos so that users can watch without audio. Great accessibility feature and also handy for anyone who's somewhere where having sound on is not ideal. Creators can record from the stories or soon Reels camera in the Instagram app or also choose from their phone's gallery. Then add a customizable caption sticker which will convert the speech to text. The feature is currently available in English and in English speaking countries with a rollout to other countries and other languages soon. And as I mentioned, Instagram We'll start testing caption stickers in Reels videos as well. That's Amazon be announced great because I can never click the button that says play the audio aloud as fast as the person starts. <laughs> Amazon announced select Lenovo PCs now support Alexa show mode in Windows 10. Lenovo's Yoga Idea Pad and ThinkPad Windows 10 PC can now be switched to show mode from a voice or app prompt then display things like trending news, timers, weather, Amazon orders, and delivery info. Anything an Echo Show can do when the PC isn't being used as, you know, a PC. The features available to customers in the US, UK, Germany, Japan, India, Ireland, Austria, Canada, France, Italy, Spain, Australia, and New Zealand come into more PC models later this year. Twitter acquired Scroll, the startup that removed ads from participating news sites for $5 per month subscription, and also operated the Nuzzle service, which emailed users trending Twitter content. Scroll will no longer accept new signups, but the service will continue to existing customers. Nuzzle will shut down on May 6th. No Nuzzle in the Nuzzle. All right, let's talk about that study I mentioned at the top of the show. Let's do it. So a lot of theorizing and correlation has been done around social media and social media's effect on mental health, especially in children. The latest is a survey of 430,000 10 to 15 year olds by the Oxford Internet Institute, published by the journal Clinical Psychological Science. The scientists compared responses in 2019 to responses to previous surveys going all the way back to 1991. Obviously, internet age, very different <laughs> between those two times. Participants answer, answered a set of questions with sliding scales about their own feelings and duration of activity in question. They weren't asked how they were spending the time specifically, such as which programs they watched or what kinds of posts they consumed. Between 1991 and 2019, there was a small drop in the association between depression and either social media use or TV viewing. There was a small rise in the association of these activities with emotional issues. Looking at a nearer time frame, study co-author Professor Andrew Shabilsky said, quote, we couldn't tell the difference between social media impact and mental health in 2010 and 2019. He also added, we're saying that the connection is not getting stronger. I was really fascinated by this. Um, my niece is uh, has six children, uh, and she got tired of her kids being crazy about tech and, and just being overly connected to screens. And so she and her husband simply removed them one day, expecting to do it for like a week, just a detox. 
And then it ended up, uh, it's been over a year, maybe a year and a half that they haven't allowed their kids to have any kind of screen time. I think Sundays they get it for an hour or something like that. And uh, she's writing a book about the experience because of the massive change in her children, how much her children are reading, how they're actually creating games together, writing books together. Uh, but she's also done a lot of research in, and uh, read a lot of books on this topic. So I was fascinated by this because it sort of says that there isn't any evidence of uh, a lot of it says there isn't evidence. And in particular, I was intrigued. There's a sentence in the abstract that says there is therefore little evidence for increases in the association between adolescents' technology engagement and mental health. So that even expanded it beyond just talking about social media. Yeah, there, there's because because these studies go back to ninety one. Uh, they ha they have to cross platforms, right? This isn't just yeah. this isn't just social media. This is using TVs and 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 stuff like that. Uh, and and what it's showing is you know four hundred thirty thousand. Now I know this is self reported. That is a nice large sample size. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a rigorous study. It's a peer-reviewed journal, and they're saying there might be all kinds of other reasons why limiting technology or limiting social media might have this or that effect, but there doesn't seem to be any link between the mental health of children and the new technology, which, frankly, is what I would expect. Every time there's a new technology, everybody freaks out and is like, oh, no, comic books are going to ruin our children. Movies, they're going to ruin our children. Television, going to ruin our children. Social media, going to ruin our children. And it usually ends up being like, no, it changes the way they behave, but it actually doesn't have a net negative effect. This is only one study, but that's what this study does point to, is like, it looks like we're experiencing that again. I think the real study I want to see is uh, what percentage of small children turn into absolute monsters when you take their, their uh, iPads away from them. Because in personal observation, it's all of them. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's well, and that's that. This is this study is about ten to fifteen year olds, right? This is yeah. not uh, given given your toddler uh, an iPad. I could absolutely see studies finding that the the iPad leads to you know less responsiveness to discipline because of distraction or all kinds of things. I, I could hypothesize all day because uh, so it's not it's not that this study says there are no effects of technology ever on children. It says ten to fifteen year olds don't seem to be less mentally well because yeah, of this particular tech use. You make a good point, Tom. Uh, my uh, niece's experience is all six children are uh, under the age that this was done. So maybe there's a maybe there's a gradual point where it's okay to, uh, to introduce it at a little heavier scale. I mean, I know as an adult, it's like if I, well, I am on the internet most of the day and a lot of that is work related, not all of it, but there are times where I kind of go like, oh, I need a detox or I got to step away from this. And it's not just to, you know, stretch my neck and my back and my legs and stuff. It's, it's to give my brain a break. And I think, yeah. you know, a lot of this is as a younger human, you are perhaps more, a little bit more impressionable and, and are still honing those skills to be able to say, I need a break from this. I need to be a little bit more balanced, you know, or thoughtful in the activities that, you know, I participated in and what I'm consuming and have it, a, you know, add, add a little balance there. And I, I think, think it's, that that's- You're spot on, Sarah. It's, it's that at, at your age, you now know, whew, I need a break. Where when your right. brain is still developing, you don't even know that that's starting to get to you. Right. Yeah. Uh, and what this shows is that there are always those pressures and social media hasn't made those pressures worse, hasn't made those lessons harder to learn, at least yet. Uh, there may be other aspects of this that aren't studied, but uh, th this, this is good news, to be honest. Yeah. The Epic versus Apple court fight is underway. Lots of little side revelations are coming out in the course of testimony and evidence. Uh, we're we're going to hold off talking about who's going to win this till we get closer to the end of it. But there's all kinds of evidence coming out in the case that is very interesting. For instance, Fortnite brought in more than $9 billion, $9 billion from Fortnite across 2018 and 2019. Epic made $5.1 in gross, gross revenue in 2020, most of which was Fortnite. Uh, hence, them having cash to do this fight. Uh, there are also emails from Epic's Tim Sweeney to Microsoft's Phil Spencer asking if Microsoft could time the launch of free multiplayer with Fortnite Season 14, promising plans that would highlight the value of consoles over mobile. Those emails happened in August of last year. Season 14 in August of last year was when Epic added its own in-app payment system and got booted from the Apple and Google stores. So uh, he wanted to be able to point to consoles and like, look, it's free to play. Everybody go to consoles. We got booted out of the mobile stores. 
Microsoft did not end up offering free multiplayer until earlier this year. CNBC spotted documents from 2010 where Scott Forstall, Phil Schiller, and Steve Jobs, all at Apple, were holding the line against letting Facebook link out to its embedded apps in Safari because at the time, Apple couldn't take a cut of in-game currency like credits in Farmville if they let them do so. Also, everyone's having fun pointing out a typo by Steve Jobs where he <laughs> typed it feces book, F-E-C-E-B-O-O-K. Uh, one of the most interesting exhibits included an email thread from 2019 where Epic Games co-founder Mark Rhine enthused about having tried a demo of Walmart's yet-to-be-launched cloud gaming service. Rhine says it felt like playing on a PS4, even though he was on mobile, and said they were talking about selling a controller attachment for a phone for two bucks. A beta was supposedly scheduled to launch in July 2019. Uh, Walmart owns Liquid Sky, which offers cloud window PCs that would be used for this service. The Verge's sources say the project, called Project Storm, was put on hold during the pandemic, and we don't have any indication yet uh, if it's coming back. So <laughs> there, there, there's so much in this, you know, I, I, I don't really understand the significance of the uh, amount of money that Fortnite has made. Why is that? Uh, why is that relevant, Tom? Oh, well, it's relevant because we didn't know. We didn't know that that okay. number. And now you can look at Epic and say, like, oh, most of their money comes from Fortnite. Uh, hence, they want to rake in the dough from Fortnite mm -hmm. and keep more of it themselves. They're already making this much. They 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 want to keep that going. And and like I said, it also means they have money to fight this court case. Right. Well, so okay, so <laughs> parsing some of the emails that you just mentioned, Tom, it's it's clear that Epic has been has been laying foundation for what was coming. Apple and Epic, we're going to go head to head. We've known this for some time. Epic trying to say to Microsoft, hey, what if we do a little of this and that? We both benefit, although really it's Epic wanting to benefit more. That all makes sense. I am not at all surprised uh, that there would have been a conversation way back in 2010, in including Steve Jobs saying, yeah, w let's not let Facebook link to its own embedded apps in Safari because we want to cut. That's, you know, it's it. in 2010, the they would have been... Yeah. Yeah, even, you know, holding the line even more so, right, than today. No one was even really challenging them on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I don't. I don't feel like anything I know now gives me any more indication of how this is eventually going to end. Well, I, I, I found the most interesting thing out of this to be the Walmart uh, disclosure. The fact that the Walmart, uh, the Walmart cloud gaming service uh, made Epic Games co-founder Mark Ryan super enthusiastic. Now, granted, maybe it was just a really good product demo, uh, but mm. I I think having more of these cloud services out there would would be a good thing. Uh, and and if it came from Walmart, fine. Uh, put it up there next to you know Luna from Amazon and Stadia from Google uh, and all of those. And 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 I I find that fascinating that that this came out in a court case. And I'm very curious if, if Walmart's continuing to pursue this or not. It sounds like they had a really good product. If if this is important, and I, I still, I, I keep having trouble finding the connections back to this case. Why is the, uh, the Walmart cloud service important in Epic versus Apple? Oh, uh, what... Apple is going to try to show is that there are plenty of alternatives for people to play games uh, because the case hinges on Epic saying Apple is a monopoly within iOS and Apple saying we're not a monopoly. There's lots of platforms. So it's the uh, scope so being able that to say is going to be argued. Walmart was even coming out with a platform and Epic was real excited about it. it helps them make that case. OK, so it's setting the scope for the trial. Uh, well, the scope for the trial is set. This, this one thing doesn't set it, but this is another plank in their defense to say like, look at all these different platforms that are out there that exist, NVIDIA, Amazon, Google, even Walmart had one that there was developing and Epic was real excited about it. And we're definitely gonna try to be on it, it sounds like. We're not a monopoly, they have plenty of options. I got you. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. All right, tell us about where all the chips are gonna be made soon, Allison. Well, the Silicon Desert is just about to get a monsoon of investment. In May 2020, TSMC announced that it would build a 12-inch wafer fabrication plant in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a small plant that will make 20,000 wafers a month on TSMC's 5-nanometer process when it reaches volume production in 2024. 
However, since then, the worldwide chip shortage has put pressure on companies to increase capacity. Three sources now tell Reuters that TSMC has plans for as many as five additional fabs to be built in Arizona. TSMC has not confirmed this, but did, it did say last month that it plans to spend $100 billion over the next three years to increase capacity. And since that announcement, the U.S. has announced plans to spend in the tens of billions to support domestic chip manufacturing. And TSMC isn't alone. Intel is building two new fabs in Arizona as well and announced Monday it will upgrade a plant in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, outside of Albuquerque, to make processors using Intel's Fovero stacking technology. The upgrade will had 700 new jobs to that plant. Yeah, man, Arizona and uh, I guess Albuquerque, well, you know, is Arizona adjacent, uh, <laughs> uh, really, really shaping up uh, to be an innovative area for startups in, in lots of ways. Uh, yeah, people have been telling that story for four or five years, uh, and this is going to continue that trend. Uh, if, if you see TSMC building six plants in Phoenix, uh, in the Phoenix area, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, Arizona is extremely um, inviting to businesses to build factories there. I worked for a company where we had uh, we had plants all over the country, and we were all jealous of the of the overhead rates in Arizona because they paid hardly nothing for their property taxes and and rental of the land and stuff. It was it's it's very very friendly to this kind of business. But I mean, this is jobs, right? This is U.S. jobs. This is great. I don't know about Silicon Desert, though. Maybe uh, maybe Silicon Canyon. <laughs> Is there anything besides perhaps just unused land where a factory could go where the hot, dry air is an advantage for this sort of thing? Oh, I hadn't thought about that, but it's dusty. Yeah, it's so dusty. Right. Like, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of my first thought is like, is this really the right place to do it? But I, I assume that cooling. there's some really good reasons. Yeah. I, yeah, I you need water. They, I they don't have water. It's the tax incentive. It's not the environment. You're right. Yeah, yeah. we'll figure out the water thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah let's see. Haven't, haven't we heard that being a problem in some of these places? The oh, Taiwan. Don't come. Yeah, Taiwan has right. a drought. TSMC has a lot of experience with that in Taiwan. So maybe they're like, oh, yeah, Arizona is a cakewalk. Not a problem. Uh, hey, folks, if you want DTNS as a video podcast, you can get the video RSS feed. Just go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash subscribe. Input Magazine has an article about how director Scott Mann and developer Nick Lines have started a company called Flawless, which uses neural nets to make better dubs of movies into other languages. Uh, usually, if, if you don't realize this, voice actors match their lines to existing footage from a script that is altered to fit the visuals. So it's not a direct translation. It's trying to take what, you know, sometimes it takes longer to say something in a different language. So they try to fit it to what the actor's mouth actually did. With Flawless, the other language version of the script can be recorded first, and then the neural network adapts it in video. The neural network is trained on daily rushes, uh, the unedited footage from a day's filming, to use millions of visual data points and create 3D models of actors' faces. It can then generate new 3D models that fit the dialogue that's already been recorded in the other language. That is then converted to the 2D images and visual effects artists come in and touch up anything the algorithm didn't get quite right so that it looks nice and smooth. The facial data processing is time consuming, but since the dialogue is recorded early in the process instead of at the end, it can run alongside filming. Flawless is in talks with studios and is working with one streaming service already. First movie using the technology is expected within the next year, within 12 months. I thought this was incredibly mind-blowingly cool. Um, you guys have to go look at the link in the in the show notes to this at inputmag.com because it is it is really, really cool. They show a lot of face mapping things where they they tear off uh, somebody's face and and you know remap it and everything. And they give you there's videos there where they show uh, you know Tom Hanks speaking in German in uh, in uh, I forget which movie it was, uh, but they they demonstrate exactly what it looks like. And, and there was a very thoughtful discussion at the end of the article too about what it means to have subtitles versus not subtitles, and if you're reading versus re being able to live the experience as the director imagined it. And yet there's other people who think it's impure to not be seeing it exactly at w as it was created. And so uh, it, it will be interesting to see, but I, I would, it, they also talked about this might just end up reaching more people. Cause if you can see a movie in your native language and really watch the movie and live it, 
you're more, I, I don't, I can't stand subtitled movies because I can't do something else like crochet while I'm, while I'm <laughs> listening. So I would yeah. love this. I, I'm a thousand percent in favor of this. I'm, I, I have the same issue with subtitles that you do, Allison. I prefer subtitles because I'm, I can't handle dubs the way that they exist currently. It just, it's like just the audio is out of, I can't do it. Um, and something like this, while it does sound time consuming, it's such a better way to, if something's got to be dubbed and yeah, you either, or I don't know, maybe you can't read. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that subtitles aren't oh, always yeah. the solution, uh, that, uh, this would make the, the experience so much more enjoyable. I've gotten so used to reading subtitles with my Korean and Chinese dramas that we watch that I, I resist this because I like mm -hmm. I like yeah. that I hear the actor's actual voice and I hear their tone even mm -hmm. though I'm reading English. I like that I'm learning a little bit of Korean and Chinese, but that yeah. that I I also realize that that's all just because that's the way I'm doing it, and that and if, this is it, their voices. Yeah, this would well, be no, the no, real it's, voices, it's, it's dub it? voices. It's, oh, it, it's oh, it dub actors. Oh. Yeah, there's a oh, great documentary about this. Like, there are people who okay. are George Clooney in Turkey. Oh. Every time George Clooney's <laughs> in a movie, this person does. So it sounds uh, right all dub. the time, then. Yeah, uh, and in yeah. fact, they've done things where they bring the actual actor, uh, and they like learn German and do it, and people are like, ah, it doesn't sound right because no, it's always been the this real other George voice. Clooney does. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's it is an actor. Um, somebody, the P squared was asking like, why don't they just adapt the audio to the video with AI? And the reason is because then the script still has to change. And what this does yeah. is it lets the script be a true translation rather than trying to adapt the translation, which sometimes changes the meaning. And that is the way current dubbing does work, right? They yeah, adapt right. it. And so exactly. you don't get the exact meaning that the, uh, that the director or the writers had, had, uh, intended in the first place. I think why you got to watch the videos. It is, it is fantastic. I really like it. I also, that there have been, I'm not fluent in any language besides English, but there are a couple that I'm fluent enough that I'll sometimes read the subtitle. And I'm like, that's not totally what it said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, close enough. But yeah, that was, could have been translated better. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, Apple released patches for iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, and watch OS, uh, to fix some serious WebKit flaws, uh, with maliciously crafted web content, attackers could exploit a memory corruption issue and integer overflow that opened the door for arbitrary code execution. Always a bad thing. Even worse, Apple says it's aware these issues may have been actively exploited. Uh, so users should upgrade immediately. Uh, this is big news to me. It's like, oh, this isn't just a regular security update. This is a zero day. Allison, you've noticed that every move Apple makes lately has become national news. Do you think we'll see Chris Wallace or Andrea Mitchell break in with the OS patch news tonight? Well, I would not be in the <laughs> least bit surprised. I mean, I am a self-avowed, unabashed Apple fangirl. Everybody knows that. And even I think it's weird how much coverage it gets. I was watching the uh, NBC Evening News with Lester Holt. They spent 8% of that night's evening news talking about the Apple Spring Loaded event and all the cool new toys that came out. And that was on a day that the Derek Chauvin murder trial finished. So it wasn't like it was a slow news day and they fit that in. It was like, it was an ad for Apple. They played clips from the from the thing, you know, the, the woman talking about how awesome air tags are. Now they did end it with, and by the way, they're going into some lawsuit stuff and federal regulation, blah, blah, blah. But still 8% of the evening news was an ad for Apple. I, I, it, it just looked really weird to me. So I am sure this will be the top of the hour. I mean, this is huge. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think the reason you're seeing that is because we still think of Apple as a little tech company. Uh, in fact, some of us, I, I think Allison, you and I are, are, are of the generation that still think of Apple as the upstart sometimes. Like we forget <laughs> that, that they are one of not only the most dominant tech companies now, but one of the most dominant companies on the planet. So this I, is a I, business I story. You for the think evening. of Apple as a little startup? I mean, I don't really, but there's part of me that still kind of has that category Mitch. from back when they were, back when Mitch. they were the underdog, right? Yeah. I like, I still have that in my 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 memory. I, yeah. I I'm overstating to say I think of it that way, but I think when I see them on the evening news, that's the part of me that still is like, yeah, but that's just underdog little Apple. It's mm -hmm. like no, they're 
like b the biggest company in the world right now. Yeah, you're you're right about it being a business story too. As the uh, as the money continues to just get shoveled into Apple's coffers day after day. And and I think that's why you see that, uh, and why you see Apple covered more than other tech companies because those other tech companies just aren't as huge. Uh, yeah. And the question I would well, ask you, Allison, it's do you also see really easy for you know a news program that isn't necessarily like you know, at the forefront of, of tech reporting to be like, look, colorful IMAX, <laughs> shiny. Well, well sure. It's like... But they also, they, they are, they're, they're even looking because it's Apple, I guess. Right. Yeah. They, exactly. if it was, if it was colorful, small company in France. They, I they... don't see like Samsung, is it unpacked? I don't see them talk about that. Right. Right. Yeah. They Samsung's might go, market Samsung cap. came out with some new phones. Yeah, Samsung's market cap just not quite as big. Also, not U.S. We're talking about U.S. news, so that makes a difference too. Do you see Facebook? Do you see Amazon covered like that? I, I do see Amazon, but I don't see Facebook. Facebook. But always in a bad yeah. light of so something naughty they did. Story about yeah. Yeah. sinister. Yeah, yeah. 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 What, what what will they know next? That's always a exactly. nightly news story about Facebook. Uh, well, this might be kind of fun. Disney first announced its real retractable lightsaber. You might remember. It was way back in April, a whole less than a month ago. Now we have a video of it in action. Kind of cool. The lightsaber, which is a toy, it's not an actual lightsaber weapon, but it has a retractable light-up blade that extends out from the hilt with the same crackling energy blades that the real Jedis use, because they are real, you know. Based on Disney's patent filings, the blade seems to act like a modified motorized tape measure, so it retracts and extends a sheet of plastic and LED lights to mimic ignition. You'll likely be able to buy one or at least use it in some capacity at Disney's upcoming Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Immersive Hotel due to launch in 2022. We have no word on price, but Disney's regular lightsabers cost about $200 a piece at Disney's Galaxy Edge Park. Galaxy so I could save you some money. Just get yourself a Milwaukee 25 foot tape measure and <laughs> you got yourself a homemade lightsaber. Got to make light come I, out of I've it though, Tom. Seen those making the rounds on the internet. People like, hey, I can do this. I got a tape measure. <laughs> uh, no, these are really cool. And and I, I haven't seen one in person, but in the video, it really does look like a lightsaber. Like it comes up fast, uh, faster than, than my tape measure does for sure. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Lori wrote in this is a message we got on Patreon. Hi, Lori. Lori is looking forward to more accessibility discussions, and we are putting together a DTNS special on accessibility. So, Lori, great timing. Lori says, as a teacher working with blind and low vision students, my approach to tech is always colored by wondering how my students are going to be able to access what their sighted peers do in the classroom. One of the things I've loved about Allison Sheridan is she always often, she often looks at new apps and equipment with accessibility in mind. Can't wait to hear what y'all talk about and thanks so much for all you do tom sarah roger and len amos joe rich the patrick's lamar justin scott and so many others who i feel are part of my friends of tech circle oh laura you're Aww. such a sweetheart that's lovely she's awesome yeah. sauce. we well, are uh, you are awesome and so are you allison so it's you know great minds great minds <laughs> we are planning uh our next theme week every once in a while we do a theme week like security or, or something like that and our next theme week will be about accessibility roger's working hard on that so uh keep an ear out we're gonna have lots of good stuff on that soon yeah, if you have uh, any ideas for what could help that special or anything that we talk about on any of our shows, feedback at Daily Tech News Show is where to send ideas, question, comments, and the like. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Justin Zellers, James C. Smith, and Miss Music Teacher. We also have some brand new bosses, Derek Silva and Kevin Brock. You just started backing us on Patreon, and for that, we thank you to our new bosses. Also, big thanks to Allison Sheridan for being with us today. Allison, where can people keep up with your work? Well, if you're tired of me sounding like too much of an Apple fan girl, you might like last week's No Silicast, where I go on an eight-minute rant about how my Mac is driving me nuts with how many different things are fiddly with it. You can also read about that if you prefer that medium, and you can get both over at podfeed.com. Excellent. Well, we are live Monday through Friday on this show, which means, you know, Monday through Friday, including tomorrow and the day after that, and the day after that, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. <laughs> Speaking of tomorrow, we'll be back with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>